Hosea chapter 7, verse 3 through 16. By their evil, they make the king glad, and the princes by their treachery. They are all adulterers. They are like a heated oven whose baker ceases to stir the fire from the kneading of the dough until it is leavened. On the day of our king, the princes became sick with the heat of wine. He stretched out his hand with mockers. For their hearts, like an oven, they approached their intrigue. All night their anger smolders. In the morning it blazes like a flaming fire. All of them are hot as an oven, and they devour their rulers. All their kings have fallen, and none of them calls upon me. Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Strangers devour his strength and he knows it not. Gray hairs are sprinkled upon him, and he knows it not. The pride of Israel testifies to his face, yet they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Ephraim is like a dove, silly and without sense, calling to Egypt, going to Assyria. As they go, I will spread over them my net. I will bring them down like birds of the heavens. I will discipline them according to the report made to their congregation. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. They do not cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds. For grain and wine, they gash themselves. They rebel against me. Although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet... They devise evil against me. They return, but not upward. They are like a treacherous bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. Well, hello. It's June 28th, and today's sermon title is, Are You Fulfilling Your Purpose? Now, To answer that question, we really need to know what is your purpose? And oftentimes when I speak to people, that's what we struggle, don't we? We want to hear from God, Lord, why am I here on earth? What is my purpose here on earth? And we want to fulfill that. Whether you're a believer or not, many of us believe that there's something more to life than what we're just doing here on earth. And if we are to know that purpose, we could live our lives a lot easier. It's To have that north star will help us make decisions, would it not? Some people think their purpose here on earth is to make other lives better. Some people think their purpose here on earth is to live a comfortable life. Some people think it's to make as much money as possible so that they could take care of future generations. Whatever it may be, we really need to know our purpose. Now, Christians, we have a purpose. For us, we have the Westminster Larger Catechism to help us. Question one in the modern translation says this, what is the main and highest purpose of mankind? The answer is, mankind's main and highest purpose is to glorify God and to fully enjoy Him forever. Now, knowing this should give us Christians hope. It should give us Christians comfort. And it should give us Christians joy knowing that we have this as our North Star. So everything that we do needs to line up with Our main and highest purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So whether you are at a decision point right now, not knowing if you should take job A or job B, or if you should move from here to there, or if you should be switching careers, whatever it may be, the ultimate purpose behind your life if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And so when you're seeking God for direction, 
know that. That is why we are here. Even today, even if your whole life is falling apart, even if nothing is going according to how you want it to be, and that could be with wealth, it could be with health, it could be with anything, are you glorifying God? Are you enjoying Him right now? Are you enjoying His presence in your life? Because one of the promises of being a believer is what? That He is with you. I will be with you. That is a promise. And so, really, it doesn't matter now, does it, whether the lights are working or not. He is with you. Are you enjoying His presence in your life? Even if you had the worst day at work, He is with you. Even when you got the word of your health or a loved one's health, a diagnosis that you didn't want to hear about, He is with you. Even when you lost your job, He is with you. Even when you are celebrating, He is with you. That's our North Star here on earth. And that needs to be the focus of you right now, even before we dig into Scripture today, perhaps that reminder is for you. Know that our main purpose here on earth is to glorify God and to fully enjoy Him forever. So with that as a backdrop, let us, let us see what God has to say to the Israelites. Because the Israelites were not fulfilling their purpose. Verse 3 says, By their evil, they make the king glad, and the princes by their treachery. So basically, what is verse 3 talking about? Verse 3 is talking about people, and maybe you know people like this, people who are willing to do evil to please those above them. People who are willing to cross that line that you shouldn't cross to gain favor of those above you. They're evil. By their evil, it says here, they make the king glad. So they're trying to please the king and the princes by their treachery. Some believe that perhaps by assassinating potential rivals, they were making the king glad. Right? But all of this talks about what? The spiritual stubbornness and demise of the king. And now there are four pictures, four illustrations that the rest of the chapter use to describe Israel. The first one is a heated oven, and we will dig into that. The second one is a cake not turned or a half-baked cake. The third one is a, a silly dove. And the fourth one is a treacherous bow. And so now let's look at the oven. Verse 4, it says, They are all adulterers. They are like a heated oven whose baker ceases to stir the fire from the kneading of the dough until it is leavened. And it's interesting because uh, with the heated oven, they also talk about the baker, and we are going to be looking at these two things. But what is a heated oven? Well, the heated oven in ancient Israel was hard to put out. Once it was heated up, you put the fire out, that oven stayed warm. And that's basically the adulterous passion. You can't just turn your adulterous passion on and off like that. So once you have that oven going, once you have your sin and your fleshly desires fueling that oven in you, and you're burning up, and then you see God and you want to you turn your life around, that oven is still going. And we all experienced that, haven't we? Can you just turn on and off sin in your life? No. Sin has this way of 
just eating at you. It has this way of just continuing to burn up. Even when you cut the oxygen off, it is still hot. And it's going to take sometimes days for that oven to cool down. Right? So it's not a switch that you can turn on or off. And, and that's the deception that we're living under. We think we can do that. Oh, yeah, I know this is wrong, but I know when the time is right, I could just turn it off. I don't know how many times I visited people in the hospital, addicts, who have faced death. They were revived by the doctors and the nurses. And I go to minister to them, and they tell me, I know this is wrong. I will never do it again. And the minute they leave the hospital, they go back to their old way of life. Why is that? Because you cannot just turn that switch off. The oven is still hot. Right? And that's pretty much the call that, I mean, God is basically calling out Israel of being that way. Their adulterous passion is still burning in you. Right? Before you come into church, you say, okay, I'm not going to do that. You, do it. you walk in, but the heat is on. People are feeling the, you, the, your heat. God is seeing the oven is still burning. Right? So we shouldn't be that way. And the only way we could shut this oven off, so to speak, is with the help of God, but we need to walk away. We need to make sure that we are not Kindling that fire, that we are not putting oxygen and fuel into this oven. And we have to let it cool down. And during that process, we need the help of one another and we need the help of God. And it says here, the baker ceases to stir the fire. It says, from the kneading of the dough until it is leavened. So the baker here is not putting anything into the oven and it's still heated up. But the baker here also is kneading the dough and just letting it sit. And by letting it sit, the dough rises, right? And so during that process, you don't have to do anything. In verse 5, it says, On the day of our king, the princess became sick with the heat of wine. He stretched out his hand with mockers. So the... During the day, on the day, it's during the day, the king and the princess were just drinking. They were not living the life they were supposed to live. They were just enjoying life. And basically, they're not fulfilling their call. They're not fulfilling their purpose as the king and princesses of their country. How about you? Are you fulfilling your purpose? Are you being responsible for what you need to be doing? COVID or not, are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? So in verse 6, it says here, For with hearts like an oven, they approach their intrigue. All night their anger smolders. In the morning, it blazes like a flaming fire. Once again, we're back into the oven imagery. And if you are a responsible baker, your job is to make sure that your oven is ready to go early in the morning. So what do you need to do? You need to make sure that it is maintaining the proper temperatures throughout the night. And here, God is calling out the baker for not doing his job. He is calling him out on inactivity, In action by not doing what he is supposed to be doing. And I think that is a reminder for us to reflect here. Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Is it enough for you to say that you are a Christian? Is it enough for you to be saved? Or is there more? Of course, there is more. Faith without deeds is like dead faith. We need to be doing. We need to, we need to be doers. And how do we become doers? We become doers by understanding what our purpose is and what is our North Star. Our North Star is to enjoy Him, 
forever. It's to glorify God. It's right there in the Westminster Larger Catechism, just for us, just for you, and just for me. That's a reminder. So are you glorifying Him? That's action. Are you enjoying Him? That's action. That's our purpose. So let's not be like this irresponsible baker. Let us do what we're supposed to do. Follow God. Allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you, to work in you, to transform you from the inside out. Verse 7, all of them are hot as an oven, and they devour their rulers. All their kings have fallen, and none of them calls upon me. This is talking about the end, the final days, the final hours of Ephraim. Four of the last six kings of Israel were assassinated. And that's really what's, what they're talking about here. All their kings have fallen. But here's what's interesting. All their kings have fallen. God says, none of them calls upon me. Even when they were failing in life, they are not calling upon God. What does that mean? What is their motivation for not calling on to God? It's pride. They thought they were too big to call upon God. They thought they were too important to call upon God. Brothers and sisters, let's call upon God always. He is here. He is with you. All you need to do is call upon God. Call upon the name of the Lord. Don't let pride get in the way of being rescued. Don't let pride get in the way of truly experiencing the love of God, the power of God in your life. We're, a lot of us are living life defeated, not knowing how much God loves you, not knowing the power of God. If you truly understood the power of God, then nothing, nothing can discourage you. So let's call upon Him. Calling upon God is how you are saved, but also calling upon God is how you continue to develop this relationship that God longs for. So let's call upon Him. Amen? The next imagery is the cake not turned or a half-baked cake. Ephraim here, it says, Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Now, that word mixes, that verb mixes, the idea is when you're baking and you mix all the ingredients together, it's being intertwined. It says here, Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. And, and what were they doing? They were making unholy alliances with the countries around them. And because of that, you cannot separate the things that were mixed in, right? Just like, the, like, just like that burning oven. You can't just turn the oven off. You can't just unmix yourself from all the things that are intertwined in you. And that's why sin is so deadly and so powerful. And the only way we could defeat sin is through the blood of Jesus Christ. That is why. If it were easy, if you could just say one day, just wake up and say, I will not sin again, right, then Jesus did not have to come. Jesus did not have to die. But it is impossible for you or me to, to be purified. We can't do it on our own. We can't unmix this stuff that was all intertwined and mixed together, and then not just that, but then baked but we're not, even, we're not even fully baked. We're half-baked, right? Half-baked cake is useless, right? 
So in terms of your purpose, you are not fulfilling your purpose as a cake if you are half-baked. You're garbage if you are half-baked. It doesn't matter how good the ingredients are that went in. It could be all organic stuff. The best of the best ingredients mixed together. If it's half-baked, it's no use at all. A lot of us have these great gifts that God has given us. But we're not fully utilizing it to glorify God. And when you're doing that, you're, you're a cake that's half-baked. Right? No use. How sad is that? Let's not be a half-baked cake. Use the gifts that God has given to you to glorify Him. Use the gifts that God has given you to enjoy Him. Use the gifts to edify one another. That's how we become a fully baked cake. Strangers devour his strength, it says in verse 9, and he knows it not. Gray hairs are sprinkled upon him, and he knows it not. They don't see the effect of sin in their lives. And that's what verse 9 is about. These are all difficult verses to translate. And that's why when you break it apart, even verse 9, there are things that makes no sense. Gray hairs are sprinkled upon him. What is that? What does that have to do with a half-baked cake? What does that have to do with a baker? What does that have to do with an oven? It's very difficult. And some translators actually try to clean that up a little bit. But here, the ESV, it's a literal translation. It's just going to present to us how it is written. So gray hairs are sprinkled upon him. If you're trying to understand that through the context of the, the 8th century B.C. readers, it makes no sense because having gray hairs was, was an honorable position. So why would that be a bad thing? And maybe it's not really gray hairs. Maybe if you're thinking about bakers, they're, they're sprinkling flour all the time. So maybe... Does that have anything to do with it? Or when mold grows on the bread, it looks like gray hairs. So maybe it's talking about the mold growing, so it's, it's, it's become useless, and he knows not. And I think that's a proper way to understand this is, you know, you've become useless, your strength is gone, you have lost your purpose, and yet you don't know it. That's a sad place to be. To have lost your purpose and not even knowing it. But there is good news. If you have lost your purpose, we could find it again today. And that's what today's message is about. Today's message is not a doom and gloom, feel bad that you've lost your purpose. Today's message is about you can find purpose through Jesus Christ. You can find your purpose. You could realign. Look at the North Star, and you could start heading that way. And that's what today's message is about. Don't despair. If you have lost your purpose, or maybe today's just a reminder, maybe you had just forgotten about your purpose. Well, let's all wake up. Let's all wake up and follow God. Let's all wake up and glorify God. Let's all wake up and enjoy Him forever. Not just on Sundays, every day. That is your purpose. God did not create you so you could just glorify Him one day a week. God created you so that you could glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. That's what we have to look forward to when we go to heaven. You're going to enjoy God forever. And we get a foretaste of that today because He is in us. He is with us. So tap into that knowledge and don't be afraid. In verse 10, it says, The pride of Israel testifies to His face, yet they do not return to the Lord their God nor seek Him for all this. Once again, pride gets in the way all the time. 
Because of pride, they did not repent. And really, that's the big problem, right? Last week, I said the theme of Hosea is return to the Lord. And God is saying over and over again, I don't know if you are hearing this, return to me. He is saying that over and over again through our scripture. The book of Hosea is return to me. The Bible is about return to me. I have made a way for you to return to me. It is through Jesus Christ. Believe in him, trust in him, and return to me. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That was Jesus' message. Repent. Turn around. Turn your life around. Shut that oven off. Let it cool down. Walk towards Jesus. That's what we need to do. That's what it means to seek God. We got to set our pride, just set it down. And call out to him. That's all what God is asking. The next imagery is a silly dove. Ephraim is like a dove, silly and without sense, calling to Egypt, going to Assyria. Now, a dove sometimes is depicted as the Holy Spirit. So it is a good thing. But here, the dove is depicted as silly and without sense. So which one is it? Well, the Bible uses both, just like the lion. Right? God is depicted as a lion, but so also is Satan in the Bible. So it, you got to look at the context. So here, Israel is like a silly dove without sense. Now, a dove, if you don't have a sense of direction, then you are a useless dove. Right? And when the Israelites were calling to Egypt going to Assyria to make unholy alliances instead of trusting in God, instead of going home to God, instead of calling out to God for help, they were looking to their stronger neighbors. They were compromising their faith. They were compromising who they are because they felt threatened. They did not look to God. And when you do that, then you're like Ephraim. You're like a silly dove. A silly dove who can't find its way home. Right? A useless dove. Verse 12 says, As they go, I will spread over them my net. I will bring them down like birds of the heavens. I will discipline them according to the report made to their congregation. That's a weird line there, once again, in the text. Scholars love to debate this. I will discipline them according to the report. What report made to their congregation? Who's the congregation? What does it have to do with silly doves? What does it have to do with birds dropping down from heaven? Well, once again, I want to give you an example of how some of the translators try to smooth that out because it, it's, it's a hard text once again. And so here's the ESV. Here's what the NLT says. I will punish them for the evil they do. Okay. So it's a little bit smoother than I will discipline them according to the report made to their congregation. Here's our beloved NIV. NIV says this. When I hear them flocking together, I will catch them. And that really makes you scratch your, your head uh, if you truly understand what the, what the original text says, uh, the NIV people said, you know what? It's talking about doves. It's talking about casting a net. So let's really smooth that out. And when I hear them flocking together, I will catch them. So that's what the NIV would say. So it's just to let you know that it just shows you how much the scholars don't know and we don't know the actual context of all this. But here's what we do know. The main idea is judgment. The main idea is discipline. The main idea is being punished for the evil deeds. That's the main idea. So even if we do run into a difficult 
passage like this to understand it's okay. As long as we get the main idea, and the main idea is God is going to discipline those who are doing evil. And then last illustration here in this chapter is a treacherous bow. Verse 13, Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. So this section begins really God's lament, Israel's refusal to repent is bringing destruction to them. They do not cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds. For grain and wine, they gash themselves, they rebel against me. God sees their heart. They're wailing upon their beds. They are crying out in their beds, but they're not crying out to God. It says here, for, for grain and wine, they gash themselves. That's, that's, a, that's how they invoke Baal, by gashing themselves. So once again, grain and wine, it's, it's just food, basic necessities. Instead of looking to God, they are looking to Baal. They're invoking the foreign gods. And that's a rebellious act against God. God says, although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet they devise evil against me. They had forgotten. They had forgotten God in all things. We have forgotten God in all things. We forget, right? We forget that everything we have came from God. When you look at you, when you look at your possessions, when you look at your skills, when you look at your talents, do you see that as you working hard to, to hone in those skills? Or do you see that as God giving it to you? And depending on how you answer that question, how you live is very different. Depending on how you answer that question, you could honestly answer, are you living your life to glorify God and enjoy Him forever? Or are you living to glorify yourself and enjoy all these things on earth temporarily? We could all see it in how we live. Everything you have came from God. Please remember that. Use it to glorify Him. And lastly, verse 16 ends with, they return but not upward. They are like a treacherous bow. They are like a bow that is faulty. They are like a bow that it doesn't work. So what, what, is, what is a treacherous bow? Treacherous bow, it lacks power. Right? When you have a faulty bow, you're not going to have the power that you need to hit the target. A treacherous bow lacks precision. You cannot hit the target because the faulty bow is not going to go where you aim. It's going to go wherever it wants to go. So if you lack power and you lack precision, what does that mean? Essentially, that means you lack purpose. So it's, today's call is don't be a treacherous bow. Live your life knowing your purpose. Live a purposeful life. Set your eyes upon Jesus and understand that you have a purpose. God has given you a purpose. You don't have to dream up a purpose for you to be here on earth. Use the gifts that God has given you 
to glorify Him. Do you have a gift? If you don't know what it is, just ask your brothers and sisters here at the well. We could all tell you what your gifts are. Let's glorify Him. How amazing will it be when we all gather together? The day is coming. As of today, we still don't know when we're opening, but a day is coming when we're going to gather together where we, where we worship together face to face. Imagine what our worship service will be like if all of us gather with the same direction, with the same north star, with the same purpose, which is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That worship will be glorious. Not because we're amazing, but because God is amazing. Live for Him. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for saving us, calling us out of darkness. Jesus Christ, we thank you for making a way for us to not only know our purpose, but to live our purpose out. Help us to rely on you today, Lord Jesus. And help us to glorify our Father in heaven. And we thank you for the deposit that you've given us, the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we thank you that we get a foretaste of heaven, a foretaste of what it's like to enjoy you, Father in heaven, forever. Help us to remember that. Use us, we pray. Amen.